We are joined today by the economist Michael Hudson, one of the most important economists in the world, honestly, in, in my view. And a, he's, you know, I, I don't think he needs introduction. He's written many books and has been an economic advisor for multiple governments and has a long history on Wall Street and academia. And you can find his work at michael-hudson.com. Today, we're going to talk about an issue that Michael Hudson has been writing about for decades and something that is you're never really going to hear from other economists, especially mainstream neoliberal economists, and that's what he calls super imperialism. The U.S. government has, its, of course, its military apparatus, which we talk about a lot here at Moderate Rebels in the Gray Zone with the war in Iraq, the war in Syria, the war in Libya. But then there's also the economic form that imperialism takes. And Michael Hudson wrote the book Super Imperialism that details exactly how the system works. So today, Michael Hudson, I want to start just talking about what super imperialism looks like today in the new Cold War. This is something that we talk a lot about. We saw that Joe Biden gave his first kind of major speech to Congress you know, we're not supposed to call it a, a state of the union because it's still his first year, but Biden gave a joint speech to Congress in which he declared that the United States is in competition with China to own the to win the 21st century, as he put it. And the we've seen that the US government under Biden and of course before under Trump has imposed several rounds of sanctions on Russia, on China. So, Professor Hudson, let, let's just start today talking about what you think the posture has been of the Biden administration vis-a-vis -vis Trump. We saw that the Mike Pompeo State Department essentially declared a kind of new Cold War on China. Uh, Pompeo gave a speech at the Richard Nixon Library in which he said that the, the famous Nixon visit to China was a mistake and that we have to contain China and eventually overthrow the Communist Party of China and some Democrats hope that the Biden administration would kind of take a step back, but we've seen that the, the Anthony Blinken State Department has continued many of these aggressive policies, accusing China of, of genocide, and we've seen that the Treasury Department just imposed several new rounds of sanctions on Russia. So what is your view on, on the new Cold War that's going on right now? Well, I'd originally wanted to call my book Monetary Imperialism. Uh, the publisher wanted to call it uh, super imperialism in 1972 because it was really the U.S. moving towards a unipolar order where it was uh, not competing with other imperialisms. It wanted to absorb uh, European colonialism, absorb European imperialism, and really be the single unipolar power. And, of course, that what really has, uh, has come about. The United States is trying to become uh, the only... Uh, dominant uh, power in the world and in today's financial times, uh, one of the reporters said, it's as, the United States wants to be the world's absentee landlord and rent collector. So we're dealing with a monetary and a rentier phenomenon. And uh, when uh, Biden gave his speech last week, it, there was a very marked change right uh, in the middle of it. The very beginning was very calm, uh, offering means of improvement uh, for the American economy, uh, and a set of proposals that were so wonderful that they don't have a chance of being enacted. And that was simply to co-opt uh, what's called itself the left wing of the Democratic Party, if that's not an oxymoron. Uh, and then all of a sudden, his body language changed, his voice changed, and there was just an anger that we, towards Russia and towards China, uh, a visceral, anger uh, that brought back the whole 30 years of his uh, tenure uh, in Congress when he was the leading Cold War proponent, uh, the leading proponent of the military. Uh, and of course, now he uh, wants to increase the military budget. So uh, while on the one hand, he's continuing the nationalistic uh, 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 trade policies of uh, the Trump administration, he's uh, escalating uh, the Cold War against Russia and China uh, in the belief that somehow if he can uh, impose sanctions and punish them economically, 
that will lead to a fall uh, of the government. Well, you can see what he's projecting here. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the United States economy is going to be in real trouble uh, once the COVID crisis stops uniting the country and a, a feeling that we're all in this together. And uh, in, certainly in New York, uh, where I live, uh, in August, uh, the uh, freeze on real estate evictions by renters and uh, foreclosures on uh, mortgages uh, is going to end. And it's expected there will be 50,000 New Yorkers thrown into the street. They've very kindly decided to postpone this until August, so at least they can sleep in the park and don't have to begin sleeping in the subways and until maybe October. Uh, there's no way that uh, any uh, Wall Street economist that I know can see that the economy is really going to recover. The stock market is going way up thanks to a Federal Reserve uh, policy of subsidizing uh, bonds and stocks uh, with 83% owned by the 1% of the population. Uh, but the Federal Reserve is not backing any spending into the actual economy. Well, that's where uh, the first part of uh, President Biden's speech came in. He was talking about building infrastructure uh, and somehow reviving the economy. Uh, but it, it doesn't look like he's going to get much support from this from uh, the uh, the Republicans. And uh, he he's, wants to be bipartisan. In other words, he says the Democratic Party, uh, as always, won't do anything that Republicans wouldn't agree on because uh, the Democrats are an arm of the Republican Party. Their role is to protect the Republican Party from left-wing uh, criticism. So uh, you can expect a, a wishy-washy sort of slow decline uh, with a, a few rapid spikes in decline uh, after, as the COVID uh, uh, crisis uh, ends. And uh, you're having almost... Uh, uh, a preparation for this by, I think Biden and the government people realize that the economy uh, cannot regain its former industrial position because it, uh, it's a rentier economy now. Money's not made by uh, companies investing in industry and in factories and means of production. Uh, when companies do make profits, they're largely uh, uh, monopoly rents or uh, resource rents, uh, or um, uh, other forms of uh, rent extraction. And 90% of corporate income in the United States is spent on share back, uh, buybacks and uh, dividend payouts, not on investing in new production. So nobody's really expecting new private investment to occur uh, in the United States. That is private capital investment and means of production. So Biden says, well, if the uh, private sector uh, uh, won't do it, then the government can do it. But his idea of the government doing it is to give uh, government money to private companies that will build uh, in industrialization. And he wants to essentially replicate the military industrial complex into uh, an enormous uh, public private partnership uh, to build very, very high cost. Uh, infrastructure that will make it almost impossible for Americans to uh, have any trade competitiveness with uh, other countries. Well, if you're going to create a high-cost rentier economy uh, that's post-industrialized uh, like that, what do you do? You say, it's not our fault. Foreigners are doing it to us. It's all China's fault. As if China had something to do with uh, American uh, deindustrialization. China's trying to to avoid the uh, rentier policies, avoid the financialization, avoid the privatization that's made America so high cost and so ineffective, um, and uh, the government's trying to uh, sort of blame it. Uh, but I think there's something else behind uh, this fight against China, and especially Russia. Uh, the democratic leadership seems to have an almost emotional, passionate, uh, antagonism towards Russia that can't be explained on uh, objective grounds, but uh, it, it's obviously there. And uh, their uh, attempt to isolate Russia is as if somehow they can recapture the dream of the Yeltsin 1990s, the dream of somehow uh, replacing uh, Putin with uh, a pliant uh, uh, alcoholic kleptocrat like uh, Yeltsin, who will uh, resume the sale of Russia's national resources, and public utilities uh, to Americans. Uh, there's no way that's going to happen. Uh, the actual effect of uh, 
of uh, the sanctions on Russia and China has been to drive them together into a unit, into a critical mass. And ironically, America's attempt to isolate other countries is turning into an attempt to isolate itself. Uh, the question in this is, what about Europe? Uh, the, in the last few days, you, there's been a lot of discussion about cutting uh, Russia off from uh, the SWIFT bank clearing system and from other sanctions against Russia. Uh, Russia's already uh, worked with China to develop their own alternative to the SWIFT bank cl clearing system. So Russian uh, uh, domestic payments are not going to be uh, that uh, disrupted after a week or two that they say it'll take to put the new system in. But what cutting Russia off from the SWIFT system does is block its trade and its, its uh, economic relations with Western Europe. The United States, I think, realizes that if it can't, get, if it can't exploit uh, the third world countries or Russia or China, at least it can uh, make Europe permanently dependent and drawn and uh, really under the, uh, the U.S. control. So if you look at the sanctions against Russia and China as a way to split Europe and make Europe increasingly dependent on the United States, uh, not only for uh, gas uh, uh, and energy, uh, but also for vaccines. These are the two issues that have been uh, in the news in the last few weeks. Uh, Blinken uh, and uh, other uh, U.S. officials have said that Russia offering its uh, uh, Sputnik V vaccine to Europe is divisive, is an attempt to break up uh, the world rules-based order, uh, which is amazing. That Russia's attempt to, uh, now that Pfizer and the other American companies are not uh, uh, producing enough vaccine to provide to Africa, South America, and Asian countries, uh, the United States is attacking Russia and Cuba and China for uh, offering uh, the vaccines and saying their, try their attempt to save lives through the rest of the world is an attempt to divide and break up the American order because only the Americans can have the intellectual property monopoly, something that uh, Blinken uh, mentioned uh, uh, in, in his speech and that uh, uh, President uh, Biden uh, mentioned the intellectual property monopoly means that uh, America gets to tell other countries, our firms have the right to say your money or your life uh, to third world countries. And uh, that will be uh, our means of, uh, well, you can't pay. Well, why don't you sell off some more of your infrastructure? Why don't you sell off more of your oil or mineral resources to us? Uh, so what we're seeing is an intensification of economic warfare uh, uh, against almost all the other countries in the world, hoping that uh, somehow this will divide and conquer them uh, instead of driving them all together. Yeah, hi, hi Professor Hudson. Uh, I, I totally agree with you about the, the Democrats, at least the political class, and their perspective on Russia. You have kind of two types that command the Democratic Party. You have these, these boomers who grew up hiding under their desks during the Cuban Missile Crisis and were indoctrinated on anti-communism. Then they went through the trauma of the 60s and, you know, saw McGovern lose and, you know, move to the center. And then you have the 30 and 40 somethings who, and so, and so they, they see Putin as a, a revival of the KGB and the evil Soviet Union that forced them under their desks in elementary school. And then you have the 30 and 40 somethings who, see Russia as this exporter of white nationalism and the right wing, and they get this constant steady stream of propaganda from BuzzFeed and other sites about that, completely ignoring Ukraine. But this is just a marketing strategy to me. I mean, there's something that you've spoken about, written about in super imperialism and in you know, recent talks um, that I think lurks behind what uh, both the Trump and Biden administrations call a great power competition. And that's you know, while the, this, this political class sees a national rivalry with Russia and uses it to unite its own constituency, a very fractious constituency, there is what you've called a conflict of economic and social systems. And, you know, I fully understand this with respect to China. You see industry journals, even rail journals in the U.S. talking about the fear of the Chinese rail system not playing by the rules which means the free market because they're receiving state subsidies and 
kicking the ass of the American rail system, expanding infrastructure. Um, but you've also included Russia uh, into this counter hegemonic system, which some would call state capitalist or socialized system versus the financialized system, where that land basically, that giant landmass, which the state in China certainly, and you seem to be saying Russia, um, is socializing, is seen as an existential threat to the very essence of what the U.S. has been constructed as, as an empire, where finance, industry, corporations have merged with the state. Um, I, I, I think you understand where I'm going here. How, how can, Maybe you can explain a little bit more about how this is actually, you know, when we see Russia Gate or this Cold War rhetoric, it's actually kind of a, a marketing device for the real conflict of economic and social systems? Well, the real existential threat isn't uh, a, trail, uh, tra a trade rivalry. It's not uh, one of technology at all. It's uh, uh, the existential threat is to the idea of an economy based on completely a rentier system. In today's world, the banks play the role that landlords played from the feudal epoch through the 19th century. And all of classical economics, the whole concept of free markets, from the physiocrats with their laissez-faire, through Adam Smith, through John Stuart Mill, and the whole of classical economics was to free industrial capitalism from the rentier class, from the landlords, from and from banking and the monopolies that banks uh, created in organizing trusts. So uh, the, the U.S. realizes uh, that uh, the... Economy's been transformed in the last 40 years, since the 1980s, since Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Uh, when Margaret Thatcher said there is no alternative, uh, of course there were many alternatives, but the United States says if we can create, if we can turn the rules-based order of free markets and classical economics upside down and say our rules-based order means no government power to regulate. No government progressive taxation, but a flat tax like we convinced Russia to have, but they still have, by the way. If we can have a rules-based order that backs the rentier class, a hereditary, financial, wealthy 1% of the population, holding the rest of the economy in debt peonage or uh, reducing them to other forms of dependency in a patron-client relation, then we've restored essentially the feudal economy. But in order for us to do that, we have to make sure that there's no alternative. We have to prevent any alternative. And China is an existential threat because what it is doing uh, in its policy, which is very largely ad hoc and purely pragmatic, China's policy is exactly the policy that made the United States the industrial power of the world in the 19th century. Uh, China, like the United States, built public utilities to uh, provide public services at low subsidized costs so as to enable its private industry not to have to pay for the costs of education, for high uh, rental costs and housing costs and high monopoly rents. Uh, China's doing exactly what the United States did and what the United States now says no other country can do what we did. We pulled up the ladder and uh, our uh, wealthy, rentier layer of the population that's got rich, now uh, having gained control of the United States and its politics, we want to control the whole world. And if there is another successful economy, whether it's uh, China or Russia or Iran or Venezuela, if there's any other economy that retains a strong state power, strong regulatory power, progressive taxation, uh, pre uh, preventing a uh, of a landlord uh, class from uh, somehow increasing housing costs, uh, uh, privatizing uh, medical and health insurance. Uh, so instead of making it a public uh, uh, public right, well, if we can prevent uh, that from occurring anywhere, then people will really believe there's no alternative but to uh, let our takeover that reverses uh, the entire last two centuries of uh, free market economics and now the economy is to be free for the 1% to act, uh, to take over uh, government uh, uh, enterprise, to privatize every part of government, including government itself, 
including the central banks especially, uh, in, including uh, the health system, the educational system, all running it uh, either for profit or at a cost that has to be paid uh, by uh, credit and uh, creation, um, and uh, essentially recreate uh, the economy of the 13th century. Yeah, Professor Hudson, the argument that you're making here, which I've, I've, I've seen very few people make, is, I mean, I, th I think it's a correct argument, but it's interesting because it, it contradicts this claim that we've seen from even a lot of people on the left who argue that the new Cold War conflict, or in general, just the conflict between Washington and Beijing, is not a clash of systems. Rather, their argument is that China is a yet another capitalist power, and it's an intercapitalist rivalry, similar to the rivalry that led to World War I, and that China and the U.S. have very similar economic systems. But, but you're arguing, in fact, the exact opposite. And I just want to read a really brief part of, of this column that you, that you published at your website, michael-hudson.com. It's called America's Neoliberal Financialization Policy versus China's Industrial Socialism. And you have an interesting quote here from a U.S. government advisor for the Reagan administration, Clyde Prestowitz, who wrote, kind of complaining, saying that China's economy is incompatible with the main premises of the global economic system embodied today in the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and a long list of other free trade agreements. These pacts assume that economies that are primarily market-based with the role of the state circumscribed and microeconomic decisions largely left to private interests operating under a rule of law. The system never anticipated an economy like China in which state-owned enterprises account for one-third of production. The fusion of the civilian economy with the strategic military economy is a government necessity. Five-year economic plans guide investment to targeted sectors. An internally dominant political party names CEOs of a third or more major corporations and has established party sales in every significant company. The value of the currency is managed, et cetera, et cetera. And international is subject to being weaponized at any moment for strategic ends. Now, in, in your column, you pointed out how this is actually a pretty funny comment coming from a U.S. trade advisor because some of those same things that the U.S. is accusing China of like namely weaponizing international trade or fusing the civilian economy with the military economy. Of course, Washington embodies that really better than any other country in the world. But he is confirming that the point that you argued is correct. His, his complaint was that China still has state-owned enterprises accounting for one-third of production and that the Communist Party of China still guides the economy. And... In, in old school terms, going back to Lenin, they would say controls the commanding heights of the economy. So, so do you think that when people on the left in the U.S. and other countries argue that this is all just a rivalry, an inner capitalist rivalry between the capitalist class in China and the capitalist class in the United States, what do you think of that argument? Well, I spend a great deal of time in China, and I've been uh, at Brussels professorships at a number of universities there. It, certain, it, it is fundamentally different from the United States. Uh, you may have noticed in the last month, China's move against Jack Ma, who was developing his uh, uh, in, information technology system into a credit system. Uh, they, they knocked him down, stopped the uh, issue of uh, new shares, the IPO, and uh, uh, said only the government can keep finance and credit in uh, uh, as a, a public utility. Now, what uh, Prestovitz called state-owned enterprises used to be called public utilities in the United States. Uh, and uh, in Europe, most public utilities were government-owned, like the national health system. Um, in the United States, uh, it, it broke away from that uh, government uh, direct ownership and management of many public utilities, but uh, it, the electric uh, utilities, the gas utilities, uh, almost all public utilities providing natural monopoly services were regulated. Uh, now they've been re re deregulated. In the last 40 years, 
uh, you have almost no uh, regulation at all. So China is, uh, by keeping public utilities in the public domain, that means that these are not vehicles for rent extraction. That is for charging monopoly rents, such as uh, we pay in New York for cable services, such as Americans pay for the internet, such as Americans pay for public health, such as Americans pay for education. China provides free education. China provides, uh, uh, and Russia, you know, basically free public health. Unfortunately, Russian public health means giving you an aspirin if uh, you have a problem, but uh, at least uh, it's, uh, it's not privatized. So the United States is uh, a rentier economy. And uh, when left-wingers uh, uh, talk about, uh, or people who call themselves left-wingers, they're really not left-wingers at all. They're, I don't know what, post-left. Um, they... Uh, they very few uh, people who call themselves with fingers distinguish between industrial capitalism and finance capitalism. Well, that's the distinguishing feature of the last century. Ever since World War I, there's been a movement uh, away from, finance, from industrial capitalism towards financialization of the economies, towards finance capitalism based on a, a merger between the financial sector and the rent extraction sector, mainly the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate, and also the natural monopolies, where the banks uh, have taken the lead in organizing uh, trusts and organizing monopolies. And so the basis of most bank credit in the United States is uh, to uh, provide uh, uh, the ownership of companies uh, or monopoly rights. Now, China doesn't make loans for these things. The People's Bank of China is the central bank. And the central bank uh, doesn't create credit for corporate takeovers. It doesn't create credit for speculation. It doesn't provide uh, an economy that enriches itself of economic rents and exploitation. But uh, uh, obviously, there are many successful billionaires in, in China, many successful entrepreneurs. But these are largely uh, industrial entrepreneurs who've actually created something. Uh, China managed to avoid the Russian Stalinist uh, uh, micromanagement that uh, blocked any kind of market feedback or any kind of spontaneous innovation. China let 100 flowers bloom. It let innovation take place. It let uh, uh, individuals get rich off innovation as long as they uh, conducted their business uh, and production and wealth in the public uh, interest defined as uplifting the quality of labor and contributing to the economy's long-term growth. Well, finance capitalism, such as we have in the U.S., doesn't live in the long run. Its time frame is short term, one quarter at most, three months. Uh, and the time frame is how can we increase the price of our stock uh, so that we can sell out and jump out of the sinking boat uh, when the time comes, uh, they're not concerned with making the economy richer. They're not concerned with making their labor force happier, better paid, or with a better standard of living, or even getting long-term pensions, which have been replaced uh, by uh, uh, defined contribution plans instead of defined benefit plans. There, it's a, a basically an exploitative system and China's whole management system, uh, although it's centrally managed, uh, you need a, a strong state in order to prevent an independent rentier class, an independent financial class from emerging and doing uh, to modern economies what uh, it did to the Byzantine Empire and tried to do uh, in, a, in uh, the Bronze Age Near East, take over the government. Uh, China does not want a, uh, a rentier class to uh, do what they've done in the United States and make America into a centrally planned economy. We're now more of a centrally planned economy than Nazi Germany was. But the centrally planned economy is in Wall Street, in the financial system, not the government. Uh, so when uh, the uh, Biden and Blinken talk about a free market, they mean a, a market centrally planned by the financial sector with zero, with the government and elected uh, officials not having any role to play except to decide whether they want to vote for uh, the Democratic or uh, Republican sponsors and backers of the Rontier interests.
Uh, how, how do you think the pandemic and well, I, I guess I could, I could say there is a there's a class in Washington that believes that COVID-19 was deliberately cooked up in a lab in Wuhan because financial capitalism has performed so poorly in this pandemic and has suffered such a setback in contrast to China's economy, which is the only major economy in the world to have grown. And they fostered this conspiracy theory because they can't really understand why that is. So maybe you can explain how the pandemic has accelerated the trends that you've been elucidating and the contrast between financial and industrial capitalism. Well, I'm shocked to hear you say that finance capitalism has performed badly. <laughs> the 1% have made a trillion dollars since the COVID crisis began. The COVID crisis is uh, the best money-making opportunity guess, that finance I'm, capitalism I'm, could have. This is a I'm, bonanza for finance capitalism. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's working. I, I, it's polarizing the economy. They're picking up all the marbles. <laughs> I meant for people who are not reptilian shapeshifters. Um, ah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be careful about what's working. And, you know, uh, uh, they, they have to somehow prepare the ground for the fact that things are not going to get better. Uh, uh, no, nobody knows uh, uh, whether they're going to go back to offices or not. Uh, they probably won't be able to go uh, anywhere near uh, the levels that they were before this uh, uh, this fall because the schools and the offices uh, uh, don't have the ventilation systems to stop aerosol transmission. Uh, they don't have fans. Most of them don't have windows. Uh, in the, uh, so there's, uh, the result is they're expecting a crash in uh, a commercial property values in the major cities. I know uh, New York landlords who uh, are trying to sell out uh, uh, their buildings here uh, anticipating that, well, things are not going to get back to normal, and they're not being offered any money at all. Because uh, all the, the buyers, the money, the, the new uh, private capital funds that have all been created with trillions of dollars in the last few months are waiting for the crash to pick up office buildings, commercial real estate, foreclosed homes, foreclosed uh, rental properties, all at pennies on the dollar, and to do what essentially what Blackstone did after uh, Obama's uh, 2008 crisis of uh, the 10,000 families he evicted uh, and uh, created the bonanza for his backers uh, uh, who elected them the banking uh, sector. So they're expecting another uh, uh, Obama-type uh, disaster that will uh, make finance capitalism even more successful in reducing the rest of the economy to a state of dependency. Do you think uh, that the lockdown policies have benefited this class that's earned trillions and trillions of dollars? It didn't. Uh, what, what's the alternative? I think there had to be a lockdown. We, we've seen what happened in uh, Asia and uh, uh, countries that uh, did have a lockdown. They didn't get sick. Uh, you had to have a, a lockdown not to get sick. Uh, the problem is not the lockdown. The problem is that other uh, countries uh, are do not uh, involve the evictions and the foreclosures that the Americans have. Uh, some things like this happened way back in the Bronze Age, which is uh, what I've written a number of books on. Uh, in Babylonia, and I think we've spoken about this before, uh, when there was a, uh, a drought or an economic crisis or a disease and debts couldn't be paid, Rents weren't due. Debts weren't due. Uh, America could have avoided the, the whole problems that the lockdown had by saying, okay, nobody's able to go to work. It's obvious they can't make, uh, most people can't make enough money to pay the rents and the uh, mortgage payments on their homes or even get by. So uh, we're going to say this is the time out of time. Uh, this is, uh, we're not going to enforce the enormous backlog of unpaid rents and unpaid uh, debts uh, that have occurred. Uh, now, to some extent, the problem has been mitigated by uh, first Trump and then uh, Biden giving a more stingy uh, uh, CARES uh, Act uh, uh, giveaway uh, to families that were able to use uh, the $1,400 and the $600 that they got and $1,200 basically to, to pay their landlords and to pay the credit card companies and to pay the banks. But once uh, the COVID crisis is over, 
there's not going to be any more bailout of people, and they're still going to have all of the arrears that they've uh, been running up, and uh, they're going to be even more debt-strapped after this September than uh, they were before the crisis. And uh, the, uh, what the crisis really did was just accelerate the polarizing trend that you have in the United States between creditors and debtors, between uh, property owners and renters, and between consumers and monopolists. Uh, these trends have been exacerbated, and uh, it doesn't look like uh, uh, the government is uh, going to find an alternative because they say there isn't any alternative. If you don't like it here, why don't you go to China? Uh, whereas Americans are not good enough in language uh, to go and mess uh, to China. Yeah, I, I hope they... It used to be, they say, if you don't like it, why don't you go to Russia? Nobody says that anymore, but they do, you know, they, what are you going to do? Oh, well, Oxy, Oxycontin, I guess, is the alternative. I don't know. When, they, when I criticize Israel, they tell me to go to Gaza, so... <laughs> I was like, okay, you'll let me in. I mean, you control the, the whole uh -huh. airspace and borders. 